Good afternoon. At the tone, Pacific Daylight Time will be 5, 4, and 30 seconds. Water. Oh my god, we're having an earthquake. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Can you feel that? Okay, this is interesting. There go the lights. Oh. are here with Jim Wasserman. It is August 20th, 2019, and we're at the Scotts Valley Library, and we're here to talk about the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So could you give me a little idea of how long you've lived in Santa Cruz? Since December 10th, 1982. Oh. <laughs> okay. Almost so 37 years. Consider yourself a local at this point. If I'm allowed to. Locals don't think so. Well. <laughs> um, so tell me what you were doing during the earthquake. I was working um, for Pacific Gas and Electric Company, which I still do. And uh, I had just left the building with one of my colleagues, and we were in the parking lot behind. This was the building on that we used to occupy at 1543 Pacific Avenue, which is next, next to Lulu's there on the top of the mall, across from uh, what is now what uh, the juice, uh, I forget, uh, John the Juice. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, I was in the parking lot behind the building uh, when the earthquake started to rumble. I was talking to a friend, just kind of figuring out what the rest of the evening had in store. Don't remember what day of the week it was. It was a weekday, though. I think it was a Tuesday, actually. Was a Tuesday. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, this started the shaking, and at first, you know, I've been, I've been through smaller earthquakes before, even medium-sized ones, and they usually kind of turn out to be not a, much of anything, so my first thought was, yeah, an earthquake, yeah. And I think we'd had a big aftershock, or not a pre-shock, like a couple months earlier, I somehow recall, like a big, like a five-point earthquake like a couple months earlier. I'm not sure. I'm sure that the USGS could vet that out, but um, nonetheless, when it really started to, to move, I, I realized this is more than just a minor quake. And I remember I'm trying to remember what I said to my friend is like, um, this is a this is a big problem or we're in trouble now. But what I started to notice, the very first thing I noticed was, <clears throat> I looked over at the buildings, it was Pennyman Title was occupying the building, at the lower level of that building, and I remember seeing the windows and the reflection of the cars kind of getting, you know, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, like bowing. Oscillating. And, yeah, and looking like they were being exaggerated because of the bowing of the of reflection of the bowing of the glass. And I thought, oh my goodness. And then I started to see the glass breaking. And then we started to see um, buildings and the bricks on the tops of the buildings start to crumble and start to fall down. And I'm like, oh my goodness. And at that point, I looked up because I was underneath near a power line, and I thought, "Oh, I want to make sure I don't this doesn't you know be in the path of a falling power line." But I just pretty much stayed still till the quake stopped shaking, which you know I think it was they said it was only what was it 17 seconds or something, but it seemed like it was it seemed like it was minutes. You know, it was just it seemed like it went on forever. I think people always say that, right? But it did, it had that perception. Um, and then as soon as that was done, I thought, okay, well, we better go, I better go see what's going on, you know, on the other side. Because there wasn't really, a, well, and the other thing too is the cars were all going like this in the parking lot. I remember seeing cars bouncing up and down, you know, which was kind of interesting. So my first thought was I should go into the mall and see if anything, you know, was damaged, anybody got hurt. I had some basic first aid training, you know, from my company, and as I was walking down, I think it's, I forget what the name of the, I think it went through the alley, but when I came out onto the mall, um, it was then I realized, oh my god, this is really a disaster, and like the facades of the buildings, had, a lot of them had collapsed down onto the sidewalks, and crushed cars, and and what was really noticeable at first was there was so much dust in the air. Because this was like 
a minute after the quake stopped shaking, literally a minute. So I walked onto Pacific Avenue and there was so much dust that you literally couldn't see more than about a half a block away. Wow. That lasted for a couple more minutes and then the dust, of course, kind of cleared. Mm -hmm. But it was at that point I just started walking down the mall. I remember though, for some reason, I can't picture how I got there, it was on one of the side streets a half a block off Pacific. And I remember uh, thinking, oh well I should see if anybody's in these buildings, let's get them out because you never know, is it going to keep going, is it going to start again, will there be aftershocks? And I remember going up to a door, and Bell Business is largely kind of closed at 5 o'clock, and I remember going up to a door that was on one of the side streets that was an entrance to a stairway that went up. And I remember grabbing the door and realizing that the door uh, deadbolt, was big in commercial doors, were like was pushed out this far, but it wasn't connecting to the frame of the door. Oh, wow. It was like completely separated, so I was able to open the door, and I remember just yelling up the stairway, hey, anybody up there, get the hell out now, come on down, get out, get out. Then as I walked down the mall, I was just kind of observing, because everybody was in shock, you know, everybody was in shock. Were and there a lot of people? There were a lot there? of people, oh yeah, there were dozens of people on the mall. And I remember a lot of people had dust all over them, their hair and covered, their clothes were covered with dust. What's really memorable is that I saw this little sports car, this big branch, a tree had fallen into the, or a huge branch had broken off a tree and fallen yeah. into the, the seat of the sports car. It was only a two-seater. And I remember peeking over and right, if I can use the, profanity that I um, experienced. I remember looking in the car and then looking up and seeing this woman completely covered in dust and I said to her, I said, oh my gosh, it's a good thing no one was in that car. She said, screamed at me, she says, I was in that car, you asshole. Oh my god. <laughs> when I noticed that, everybody's nerves were pretty frayed at this point and a lot of people were and not just then, but even in the days following, nerves were really frayed. And a lot went on in the subsequent days that I could talk more about when we get to that. But that's, that's what happened initially. Um, what I realized that I needed to do was to prepare to help people. I lived right up on King Street. So I went home. Um, my friend who I was living with friend was visiting from the East Coast and had never been to California before oh, no. and had just experienced this. And uh, we opened up a bottle of wine and drank the whole bottle of wine between two of us in a very short time. And I remember feeling nothing, absolutely nothing. And I'm not even a wine drinker. It was like, okay, I got my bicycle, I got my bike lights, and I rode my bike back downtown and locked it up and kind of was prepared to start help dealing with helping out the situation. I felt like that was the best role I could play. And I spent the rest of most of the evening downtown predominantly, and I don't know what part of the story that, you, that you're aware of, but the Santa Cruz Coffee Roasting Company's, the, the bookshop Santa Cruz wall fell onto the top of the Santa Cruz Coffee Roasting Company and collapsed the whole building. And they knew that there was an employee that was trapped somewhere inside that building. And I ended up just being in a, I guess you call it a bucket brigade, which was outside the building in a line of people just passing buckets of debris out. Oh, wow. But while we were doing that, we were underneath, uh, against this about 20 foot high wall, and there was a lot of bricks that were loose at the top. And every few minutes, another aftershock came, and everybody was in the bucket brigade, ran away from the building, and stuff fell down, and then everybody came back and continued this. And unfortunately, we found out later that that woman had died in this, um, I didn't know her or anything, but um, I was there for a couple hours. That was when I first started doing that. Um, and then after that, um, what happened then was the finally the authorities started to rally and started bringing in people and bringing lights and things like that. It was starting to get dark now. This being October, it was dark. it was pretty much almost dark by I think about two hours after the earthquake it was getting dark, and the authorities came in and started setting up lights and things, but they 
became extremely agitated by all the people that were there doing this informal volunteer work mm -hmm. and started bossing people around and get the hell out of here we have no business being down here and, and everybody that had been there was like wait a minute we were here helping out for the last two hours before you guys ever showed up and now you're just you know giving us a lot of grief about that and there was another that really interesting thing that happened I think a little later that evening but they called off the search for the woman in the coffee roasting company because they felt that it was too dangerous and as a result of that a bunch of her friends or people that were somehow acquainted with her made a protest and sat down in the intersection of Cedar and Mission or Center, Cedar Center, you know how it meets right up there, it merges in. They sat down in the middle of the intersection to um, basically block traffic because they wanted to, they were, they were protesting the idea that they were their friend, that they weren't going to continue this effort um, and the police came over and assaulted them like very heavy handed, got very physical with them. Mm -hmm. So the police were really, really agitated. They were not in control of their own emotions is what it felt like to me. And that continued for, for days later. And in fact, you know, as I wandered over the next couple of days uh, around the downtown and the, and, the near, and the near west side, which, you know, as you know, the, the downtown is on this sort of soft, they call it liquefaction soil or something where the river it's old riverbed right. so the houses that were all along washington and chestnut and cedar um there was like these it was almost like radials went out because you could go in this block were three houses destroyed and then on the next block three or four houses did. and it was like almost like a line that was created across because houses over here were more or less intact and on this side but you know it, it was almost like like a earthquake radial went out. I don't wow. think that there's a, I don't know, any kind of technical explanation for that. But what had happened was a lot of the houses had basically tipped off of their foundations and came crashing down. And a lot of porches fell and a lot of the front decks collapsed down. Um, most of the houses didn't actually fall down, but they were damaged beyond repair. Mm -hmm. But what I noticed then of the next couple of days, um, and you know where Santa Cruz High is, right on, right on Laurel there, mm -hmm. um, the butts up against Laurel. Now there's a big chain link fence, but there was no fence then, and people that were afraid to stay, and the people were sleeping outside. Everyone was afraid to, not everyone, but a lot of people were afraid to be inside. I slept with my shoes on, and every night there was aftershocks, I mean, a really strong aftershock. We'd get up and we'd run out and we'd come back in. A lot of people were afraid to um, stay inside. And so a lot of people set up tents on the field at the high school. Oh. And at that time, and I don't know if it's still the case, camping is illegal. So the police cited the people for camping. Really? Yeah. They came and cited people for camping. And at that time, right across the street from the high school was a Salvation Army office. I don't know if it's still there. It is. And a woman who was a volunteer or worker from the Salvation Army came out to, um, in defense of the campers and, and, and gave, them, gave them shit, gave the police shit over what they were doing. And she was arrested. Oh my God. So it was this kind of climate that was going on yeah. around town. The police were like, arresting people for camping outside even though it wasn't even safe to be inside your homes it was like they didn't they totally didn't get it mm -hmm. and I could never to this day understand what were they thinking you know but um I'm trying to remember what else I did that day I mean at some point they basic the police and the authorities basically told us to leave and get out of the downtown and they didn't want anybody down there anymore so I eventually just went home mm -hmm. um, but in the subsequent days, um, when I was, I was working for PG&E, so the first two days we were in that office and nobody wanted to be in that office. I remember going in the office the next morning and there was a file cabinet that was one of those like this tall file cabinets, you know, metal file cabinets. And I remember noticing that underneath it, there were a stack of papers underneath this 
enormously heavy file cabinet. And I said, how could that have happened? And I could only guess that in the shaking, uh -huh. the papers were, were coming down and the cabinet was jumping up and down and landed on the paper. I thought that was really kind of fascinating. But I was, um, what they did was they did a kind of a triage and our, our building became kind of a customer service call center. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, though, no one could get through. The lines were completely tied up. And I remember being on the phone talking to people, and every, every call was like, oh, I've been waiting for four hours to get through to you. Can you tell me when my power is going to be back on? And the answer was no. And it was, to me, an enormous waste of time. Why are we doing this? I even suggested that they put a radio announcement out to say, if you're trying to get through, just wait. We know we are out of power. But they didn't do that. for reasons I don't I don't know I don't want to be critical of that sure. but um, I was two days doing basically answering phones at PG&E which is not my normal job by the way um, and then I was recruited to do some assistance which was delivering food to some of the emergency stations and what was fascinating and I'm remembering this as I go along I was given a, a bit and I didn't have like a class whatever license at the time you know they just said Jim go go do this you know they were a lot of people were well, fudging the rules a little bit yeah. in, in the in the interest of the need um, they sent me over to Safeway on the west side and um, to, to pick up food and when I, I got the Safeway I was instructed to go to the loading dock and when I got the Safeway there were people lined up all the way across the parking lot to get into Safeway to get supplies. I felt a little bit of guilt when I was able to drive around the back of the Safeway and the Safeway people just came out and just loaded up my van with all kinds of supplies. Wow. And I was able to drive that back and then, uh, I don't remember it was the same day or the next day, they sent me out to Watsonville because Watsonville had like a, a staging area for the, and if you recall, or if you, or not recall, but if you know, Watsonville was extremely badly damaged as well. The downtown was equally destroyed. The houses in Watsonville were equally damaged. And there were a lot of areas that were completely blocked off. But because I was in a pg e van and I had a pg e ID, they let me drive into these areas. And I kind of took advantage of it by in, in addition to dropping off the supplies that I was supposed to bring, took advantage of being able to kind of drive around in the areas that you weren't supposed to be in and see the damage firsthand yeah. down on uh, Main Street and all that. So that was kind of interesting. And I spent the next few days um, after that over in the office I work in now, which is our 7th Avenue facility, basically making food for crews. I mean, they made they put me in a position of, of cooking. Yeah. <laughs> they brought all these big gas burners and these giant pots. They bought these giant pots and they brought them in and all these all this food that I and, and we'd gone back and loaded up more and more food at bigger vans full of food and brought it all for the crews because we of course we brought crews in from outside of the area mm -hmm. as well. So there were thousands of workers and crews coming in. And our 7th Avenue facility was one of the staging areas for dispatching those crews out. So I had a job for like two, two days or something of making sandwiches and giant pots of chili and soup and things like that. It was kind of whatever they want me to do kind of attitude, you know. Yeah. So that's, that's what I was doing. But after that, um, things kind of settled down a little bit. I had a chance to kind of roam a lot of the neighborhoods and take a lot of pictures which I brought with me. I've kept these pictures all these years yeah. and uh, I show them off once a year on the earthquake anniversary. People are like, Ooh. Um, but um, yeah, it was really interesting and of course the, the weeks that followed, you know, what happened with the downtown businesses really couldn't stay open mm -hmm. because the buildings were too damaged and I don't know if you've heard about the tent city and all that but they built, they erected all these tents mm -hmm. And all these businesses were in tents, like logos, and, and I remember through the winter, because it was through the whole winter, and maybe even, I don't remember how long those tents were up there, might have been a year, or maybe even longer than a year, I wish I remembered. Maybe your story and people will, will reveal that. Um, but I remember how cold it was in those buildings, how difficult it was for those businesses 
to do to do business in yeah. those areas, and I have pictures of them erecting the tents and, mm -hmm. and and the whole tent city kind of thing. I also remember people just being really agitated, driving badly, aggressively. Like there was some kind of this overall I don't know what the the right word is thing that was kind of took over people's mentality, and there was a lot of people with real short fuses kind mm -hmm. of kind of thing was what I sensed. For the next, for the first like week after the after the earthquake, you know, it was like, whoa, people are really kind of really tense and uptight, and uh, and a lot of people didn't have anywhere to live either, so that made it a, a very difficult situation. But you asked about emotional, emotionally, physically. Myself, I don't know. I had, I was just all adrenaline. Yeah. The first day, I mean, absolutely. I felt like I was on my game. I was helping out. I was. Had purpose, yeah. you know, like that. I was in total adrenaline thing going on. Keeping busy. Um, I felt like I my emotions were pr pretty good, but I noticed there was a lot of frazzled emotions yeah. around, um, yeah, around the, the the climate of the town at that time. And so, do I understand the significance of the earthquake when it's happening? Yes, I I certainly did. I could tell this is a big one. Mm -hmm. And um, how did it impact my life? It, um, didn't really in any fundamental way because I didn't lose my home, I didn't lose my job, so I guess I was okay, yeah. you know, and it was, I guess you could say a novel experience. Um, <laughs> how did it impact the Santa Cruz community? Huge, huge, and I don't know what other people have said, but what my observation was, and this is, you know, somewhat opinion, I think, but what happened was that the businesses were so badly, were doing so badly in the downtown that they weren't able to survive. Mm -hmm. And the city, just like it is no different today, mired in bureaucracy, nobody can get anything, no decisions could be made, everyone fought, everyone fought, mm -hmm. and then nothing happened. Mm -hmm. And for so many months that nothing was happening, many businesses left the downtown and moved to different businesses in Capitola. The car, all the car dealerships downtown all moved down to Capitola. And it was a kind of a domino effect of the earthquake created a certain financial dis damage to the town, but the lack of being able to do anything about it exacerbated that problem in a really big way. And I noticed that Watsonville was completely different. They had it together, they figured out what to do, they started rebuilding within a couple of months, they were already building plans, wow. and they were already, within a year, they were already recovering their, their downtown, whereas Santa Cruz was just in shambles. It was absolutely in shambles because, oh, we can't touch this, and we can't do that, and, and I remember there's the building on the corner of Cooper, I think it is, or maybe it's, is it Cooper, where they, um, they kept the facade, the two outside historical walls from like the end of the 19th century and rebuilt the whole building on the inside. And they, so for months there were these huge poles holding up the walls. Oh, wow. This is, is it Cooper? Is it the Cooper House? It's not the Cooper House. The Cooper House is another story because there's a lot of people that weren't convinced that it needed to be torn down. Right. And I think that a lot of that was political or, or, or financially driven. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of tragic because the Cooper House was such an iconic you know, location. I don't remember if it was that block or the next block over, but there's a, there's a historic building facade that was, they gutted the whole, they came in, they scooped out the whole inside of the building. And at one point, the whole building was just two, two and a half story walls supported by wow. these long poles. And there was nothing inside. And then they eventually rebuilt the whole inside, and it's, I forget what's in there now, I've been in there a couple times, I can't remember the name, the name of the businesses, but that was one of, one of the more interesting things. But one of the more interesting things that happened in the next couple years after the earthquake is that corporate interests started to realize that there's opportunity in Santa Cruz, mm. and the corporate interests were not welcomed here. Right. So that created even more strife in the downtown. And the first people that came in were the United Artists Cinema 9 and Borders Books, which is no longer there. Mm -hmm. And people were absolutely up in arms over the fact that corporate interests were coming in. Starbucks and The Gap and I'm trying to remember some of the earlier businesses that came in. Um, there was um, another 
bookstore chain that doesn't exist anymore that only lasted a few years. Yeah. But I have to admit, it, it was the corporate America that saved the downtown, ultimately, because mom and pop businesses could not do it. They were done. And a lot of them just left and went elsewhere and never came back. Mm -hmm. So it left this huge void. And you know they're building that building right next to Lulu's right now. Apartment right? garage. Apartment garage. That's the last lot. The last lot. Mm -hmm. And I just marvel at the fact that it took 30 years to, be, to re completely rebuild the downtown of Santa Cruz. Watsonville was rebuilt in two years. Two years. It was back. And downtown Santa Cruz, it lagged and it lagged and it lagged. And I think it, it, um, it had a, a devastating effect on the economy here for decades until now, of course, it's a thriving downtown. Mm -hmm. But it's like we can't get out of our own way is kind of what it feels like to me. And we still see so much of that. There's been other development projects. Remember, it's 10 years after the earthquake, they wanted to develop uh, you know, the lot across from the Dream Inn, and they still want to do that. And there was a convention center that, you know, and there was all kinds of great online stuff, you know. Maybe it was more than 10 years, 20 years after the earthquake, I think it was. There were these great models and online 3D diagrams, and it was like, oh, this looks pretty good. You know, they wanted to rebuild that, build that. They wanted to rebuild the one on the beach boardwalk. That's the old, that old white, um, this, uh, Hispanic looking building mm. down there. I forget what it's called. Yeah, but it's called. Anyway, the point being is that we just couldn't get out of our own way, and, and the, the politics got so much in the way of the recovery mm -hmm. that it just boggles the mind. But it's ultimately, again, you know, repeat, the, the corporate interest that really brought the town back, yeah. and yet there's still this sentiment against that. You know, it's, it's kind of an irony that Santa Cruz is just kind of the way we are, you know. Well, I have a kit now, you know, yeah, I, I, I admittedly don't keep it up to date because it's hard, it's yeah. constant, you know, the food goes bad, the water has to be recycled back in, but I have this kit, you know, your basic cookware and wind-up radio and all that first aid and all that other stuff, and we get a lot of training at my, at my company too, I've gotten first aid and CPR and okay. eight. AED, what is it? AED. Um, AED training, you know, all that sort of stuff. You know about that. You're gonna, you do emergency response work, yeah. yeah. So, and you know, we're always um, reminding people to, you know, be prepared. And, and you know, yeah. I, I could do better just like everybody else. Um, so, you mentioned having a radio in your kit. Mm -hmm. um, and some other folks that I've interviewed have mentioned the usefulness of radio when it came to finding out information about what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, what did you do for information at the time? Because you know we know computers and cell phones weren't so prominent, so a lot of people turned to radio or news if they could get the news on their TV. But well, I had t I had all the services, so I don't think I was more than a day without. Okay. Services, you know, I mean, being where I was on the west side off Mission Street, um, our power outage uh, was really temporary. Whereas other people, of course, were in days and weeks. Highway 17 got shut down. Mm -hmm. I had a friend who happens to have that happens to be her birthday, oh. and she was driving over 17 right at the Laurel, where the, the rock slide happened. Oh. She got right past it, and right before the rocks came down and buried the road. So it has really nice. impacted transportation in and out of the county, mm -hmm. much like that storm two and a half years ago did, if you recall. Mm -hmm. But um, I didn't really have, the radio I have is one of those wind-up, battery and wind-up ones, but I actually never really used it. It's just in the kit, sitting there for the, if and when I ever need it, yeah. you know, kind of thing. I have, you know, similarly wind-up flashlights that are, you know, these you know that don't take a, at battery power, yeah. And, uh, but yeah, mostly mostly that. I, I don't I haven't really dwelled on it that much yeah. since then. Yeah. yeah. What's it like to reflect on your experience thirty years after the fact? I'm old. <laughs> Older, not old. Older. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I haven't done a lot of reflection. I just think that I wonder if we're really 
how prepared we are. It feels like we have a, a habit in this culture of just repeating the same mistakes over and over again, and I think that we're going to end up doing that. People are going, oh my God, hair on fire! How would I have known? You know, it's like, but there is a lot you can do. One of the best things, and this is something that we do do, is we have a common person outside the area that we contact. And that's really valuable. I wish more people would just, if you didn't put a whole kit together and didn't do all that other stuff, which of course you should, medicines especially, but if you didn't do any of that, have a contact that's out of the area that you and your immediate family members all know to check in with as the single point of contact so that they can be the liaison between, you know, all the other people in your family or your immediate group. That's, that's huge. Yeah. Because otherwise it's like, well, how do you know if anybody's hurt or not hurt or missing or dead or just out of, and you know, you worry because you don't know and you always think the worst. I do remember people calling me from outside the state going, thinking, I mean, the, the way it was conveyed in the media was like the whole state of California just collapsed, you know, it was sure. just so overblown. I mean, yeah, here in Santa Cruz, in the downtown, in certain areas, it certainly looked devastating. But for the most part, it really, you know, the Bay Bridge, Cypress Overpass, those were the most devastating things, especially the Cypress Overpass. That was the huge tragedy, that pancaking of that thing, and all the people that lost their lives there. But then the idea that people were calling from the outside the state going, you know, are you okay? And that was legit because I was in Santa Cruz. But but the thing people thought people thought that the whole state of California had just fallen down or fallen into the ocean. It was just the way the media worked. They didn't. They really didn't do a great job of, of, of accurate job of conveying the the accuracy of the situation. It mm -hmm. seemed to me at the time. Yeah. Yeah. And I was the story I was telling about the the woman in the car. That's the car. Oh wow. Yeah, and you can see the buildings. This, I don't remember if this is the Ford st department store. But the building on the Ford, the roof of the Ford store, yeah, this is it right here, the Ford department store roof collapsed and a woman got pretty badly injured there. Here it is, the Ford department store right there. This is one of the downtown buildings, I think from the back side. But, um, yeah, and this is this is what it looked like on the onset. This is this is within hours of the earthquake, right here. Did you go home and get your camera? I did. Got my camera. Yeah. I only had a few frames left on it. Um, so the next few days is when I took a lot of these other pictures. Um, yeah. This was this is Laurel, kind of by. Well. The high school. It's right across from, here's the high school field right there. Oh. So I forget what corner this is. Um, Blackburn or? Maybe those. Blackburn, maybe the next one up. If you notice the, the sidewalk and how, you know, how buckled it was. This was not construction. This is, <laughs> the earthquake did that. That's kind of interesting. This is down at Beach Flats. Mm -hmm. This is one of the houses, this is along the west side, either Washington or Chester or one of those streets along there. This is also right downtown on the, on the Pacific Avenue Mall. And these are just houses along the west, near west side where the, the porches had all collapsed. And, and uh, I thought this one was really interesting. Not only so much that this porch fell down, but what was really fascinating about this, and you can't see it from this picture, is you know there's a curb here against the sidewalk that the house is like a curb about so high, not the curb to the street. There's the street, the sidewalk, and then there's this other curb. Mm -hmm. And this house was hanging over the edge of that curb. So the whole house moved like three feet. This whole two-story house moved like three feet over. Oh, wow. Uh, pretty fascinating. A lot, of, a lot of superficial damage like yeah. this, but you can see um, this is in Watsonville, one of those beautiful old Victorians. Oh. There's a mobile home, I don't remember where that was. This was the disaster recovery center in Watsonville that I drove out to that day. This is where I was telling you I got to drive around and see. They had a camp there for people. Mm -hmm. And um, I think
think this is downtown Watsonville also. I'm pretty sure this is the down, yeah, downtown Watsonville. Yep. And, and then this is starting when they started clearing. This isn't earthquake related. This is re, like construction related. They started clearing and rebuilding things. Total fitness is there now. Oh, wow. So this is... This is Total Fitness. This is that parking lot where the farmer's market is right here. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing is they're getting ready to build the tents, the tent city. The oh. Del Mar, there's a Del Mar Theater um, from behind or from the side. Oh, yeah. I'm not really sure. It's been so long. Um, that was fascinating to see. And this was a result of the earthquake, I'm pretty sure. Or maybe it was part of the demolition. I can't remember anymore. This is definitely part of the demolition. They started to take down the, the, the building. You can still see the letter for, from Ford's, you know. Oh, Ford's department. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure you have access to all of this kind of stuff. Oh, yes. So you probably don't need this, but um, this is the 10 year after edition. Oh. This is the 10 year, this is the October 99 Nine. special edition. <laughs> and if you need, if you want, you can borrow this too. I don't know if you, if you have access to it. Sure. But it's kind of an interesting, yeah, it's kind of interesting. I haven't looked at this in a really long time. But, uh, of course, the whole, sort of the whole downtown, the physical aspects of the downtown changed, but so did the demographics, because when you brought, when they brought in new businesses, and I don't think it's only a matter of the earthquake rebuild, I think it's just a matter, it's, it's a sign of the times. It's, it's a new, I mean, it's a different generation mm -hmm. now than it was then. People, you know, kids that were in college then are all, they're all parents now, or they're parents' age now. But this talks a little bit about the actual, you know, liquefaction and how all that stuff happened. Mm -hmm. I did something all, on, on the one year anniversary of the earthquake. This also includes Oakland, okay. San Francisco. Um, although this was the Sentinel um, in Los Gatos. On the one year anniversary, I decided I wanted to go hike to the epicenter in Nicene Marks. So I went out there and I ran into Sandy Lyons who is a historian and local historian here. Sounds familiar. I think he's still, I don't know if he's retired. And he was leading a camera crew on a little story thing and I ended up hiking with them to oh. the epicenter. That was kind of interesting. I can remember because the guy had this camera, you know, back then it was like this massive thing. He had to lug it up and down all these steep uh. hills and trails, you know. But um, I remember going and, and it was kind of interesting just choosing to go that day. but having been not the only person yeah. had that thought, somebody yeah. from the historical society also had that thought, and I got to kind of tag along there with them. But I think that's it. I very much appreciate you uh, sharing your story and your, and your photographs and your memorabilia.